Hello, Internet, and welcome to The Collective Arcana. We are a channel all about tabletop gaming. My name is Wyatt, and today we're going to be talking about the new book in the Lost Omens line for Pathfinder 2nd Edition, Impossible Lands. If you've seen any of our other reviews for the Lost Omens line, uh, you know that I sort of uh, been surprised myself at how big a fan of it I am as a home brewer by uh, default. Uh, and this book is no exception. At 350 pages almost, this book is still jam-packed, as big as it is, with all kinds of information, all kinds of mechanics, lore, everything you could want from this type of book. This is following in the uh, footsteps of the Mwangi Expanse and the Absalon book, where the folks over at the Lost Omens team are doing a deep dive on a section of their world of Galarian, which is sort of a kitchen sink type of a setting. There's a, there's a region or a country that will fit almost any type of story you want to tell in a TTRPG, as long as it's not something super modern or futuristic, for example. Uh, and that means that there's a lot to cover, especially in a book called Impossible Lands. It's covering some of the weirdest places in the setting. So let's start by talking about what some of those places are. Uh, we begin with Alkenstar, which is home to firearms uh, and has a sort of Wild West steampunk sort of vibe. Uh, in Alkenstar City, uh, smog from machines bloat, blots out the sky, while people make do in a land that is somewhat, um, I won't say magically adverse, but definitely where magic does not behave itself and operate the way that you might expect. We also get a look into the uh, Dwarven Sky Citadel of Dongan Hold, uh, which is a nice precursor, in theory, to the uh, book High Helm that we're going to be getting next year, which is a deep dive on the um, biggest Dwarvish Sky Citadel. So it'll be really cool to, within a year of each other, have two of these Sky Citadels to compare and, uh, and look into. Of course, High Helm will be a much deeper dive on just that one uh, place. Uh, whereas this is just a fraction of this book. But still, it's really cool to go from zero <laughs> Dwarven Sky Citadels in 2nd edition to having two within a year. Bopan, I think is the pronunciation. Uh, someone be sure to correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. Uh, is a sort of pocket of the first world. It is where fey magic has seeped into and shaped the land because of some stuff that happened in the four time. You'll have, you'll have to read about it. Um, but the gist is that it's this sort of extra weird place filled with these sort of extra strange people. Um, it is both whimsical and more dangerous than your average, uh, your average sort of uh, forest or jungle type region because of uh, its proximity to the first world. Or if you're coming from not Galarian, the uh, Feywild or the Land of Fairy, whatever the case may be for the setting you're using. Uh, but that here it's called the first world because it was the prototype uh, where the gods and creators and all that just said, ah, we'll just, it's okay if we mess it up. It's, you know, it's first world. We're just, this practice run. And you can imagine that set very well with the Fae that still live there. Next up, we have Geb, named for its founding wizard, who became a ghost. Uh, it's a country full of undead. You can read up a lot more about it in the Book of the Dead that we did, uh, that uh, came out uh, earlier this year. Um, I don't remember the exact date. Um, and we did a review on that. It's a very good book. A lot of information about Geb is in there as well. Um, but just from a setting perspective, whereas that was more of a lore and undead focused book, this is just a general sort of setting. Politics and things like that are more the focus here. Um, and so if you're looking to supplement or you're not, you know, super concerned with an undead game and you just want to know what it's like for the people who have to live near a country like that, you know, that's what this is for. If you hadn't guessed, it's pretty bad in Geb, especially if you are a human or alive, as they call them, uh, the quick and the dead. So the quick are the living and the dead are the dead. Um, we get a breakdown of two of the major cities, uh, including the capital of Mechatar. Next, we have Jamare, Jalmare, Jamare, I think the L is not emphasized too much. Uh, a beautiful and fertile island country that is a settlement of Vudra, which is sort of Galarian's equivalent of fantasy uh, India, sort of. Uh, and as such, we get a few Vudran deities and some a Vudran spin on uh, some we've already seen. We get a lot of that sort of spins on deities we've already seen in these Lost Omen books, which is really cool as we get the regional variants of them in addition to the uh, new deities that are more uh, localized there, you know, by default. Uh, and so that's really cool. We also get a couple of uh, major cities for Jalmarine, including the capital as well. 
Next, we have the Mana Wastes, which is the scarred land between the warring wizards of Nex and Geb. Uh, the Mana Wastes are home to mutated uh, peoples and uh, a lot of other stuff that would not be people. Um, we also, uh, they are, these people are desperate to survive a brutal existence in a place that is more suited to adventure than settlement. Um, and we also get a bunch of new hazards and wild magic stuff to make the Mana Wastes feel like a place where uh, magic is dangerous and unpredictable. Uh, for people coming from other settings, if you've played Eberron, it's very much uh, the Mornlands, this place where magic just, uh, where people magic too much and it ruined things. Um, and so, you know, living in the real world, it's it's our world where it's, you know, dying. But anyway, um, so the Mana Waste is a very cool place to play. Uh, and has a lot, and they have a lot of rules and stuff like that and recommendations on how to best emphasize the strange nature of that place in your games. Finally, we have Nex, a magical utopia, but only on the surface, with various consequences of the unbridled magic use and experimentation throughout its uh, timeline, creating numerous threats, um, including rampaging extraplanar beasts and, of course, class warfare and civil unrest. So, uh, you know, very beautiful architecture, very beautiful everything. Um, and then as you start to read through, you begin to see this place is in a lot of trouble. Um, and so it's a very cool sort of vibe and a great uh, inspiration for me and for my homebrew setting. So within these impossible lands, we get deep dives on locations, cultures, daily life, uh, and the various sights, sounds, and threats that might draw adventurers to each of these locations. And each location has uh, plot hooks and notable NPCs galore across all those regions. Uh, and as always with the Lost Omens line, you can't turn a page without finding inspiration for your next adventure. Uh, like, what's the Murmur Dome? What's in there? Uh, wh wh where's that adventure path? <laughs> I, I, I gotta know. Sort of bridging the gap between uh, mechanics and lore, let's dive into the ancestries, because we do get a number of new ancestries and some heritages and stuff as well. Uh, so, and that's very cool. It's always great. The Lost Omens line has really been the... Uh, premier place to get new ancestries in the uh, in second edition Pathfinder, um, and, and uh, that makes sense because they are so tied to the lore, whereas a lot of the rule books are more tied to mechanics and um, the player side, adventuring side of things. Um, but really, something as big as an ancestry in a region like that, you're going to want it tied to the setting specific books that don't always quite fit in the core rule books. First up, we get the Gorons, which are functionally immortal plant people who uh, feed on sunlight and sort of uh, reincarnate themselves through a seed every 20 years or so, being slightly different each time. So it's less like a true immortality and more like um, shared memories across generations sort of thing. Um, but uh, they are very delicious. They were made to be food originally uh, and eventually evolved sentience. Uh, they can tap into their many past lives to get information or abilities, skills, and things like that. Uh, they heal in the sun, and they can command plants, and they are very cool to look at. Just want to interject here. I really didn't think that I would care about or want or need Gorons, considering we had plant people already in the Leshy, uh, but they really could not be further apart. They are very different in flavor and mechanics and design and goals, so... Uh, don't worry about that. They, I'm, I was surprised how big a fan I was of them. Speaking of surprises, we have the Kashrishi, which are uh, somewhere between a rhinoceros and a rhinoceros beetle person. Um, they are small and stout with prominent horns that uh, both give and signal their psychic abilities, uh, specifically empathic abilities, as well as, of course, makes a great natural weapon. They are natural climbers with a knack for magic and can develop natural armor. Next up, we have the Nagaji, which are these serpent folk. Uh, they are typically bipedal with uh, scaly bodies and serpentine heads, but uh, there is one variation that is a serpent snake body from the waist down and a very much regular human from the waist up. Um, I would really like, and I probably will in my world, have them, you know, have an option for a one that is scales all up and down, but with the snake tail, but, uh, you know, that's really just a preference thing. Um, they are... Very cool. There's, they have 10 hit points. They uh, have a natural bite attack. They are strength as their uh, boosted ability score, if strength and free. So it's going to be a nice new uh, martial ancestry if you really want a nice 
a strong, powerful frontline character. Nagaji might be for you. Uh, they get a nice bite attack, and their fangs can be poisonous, uh, and they are resistant to mental magic and get a nice hypnotic stare ability, which is very thematic and cool for a snake person. Next, we have the Venara. Finally, we have uh, the monkey folk that I've been waiting for. I'm very excited about them. Uh, the Venara are a mischievous but not malicious uh, people that are sort of have very trickstery vibes. Uh, they use their tails and their natural quickness of both mind and body to embarrass foes and stay out of danger. Uh, and stories even say that they can uh, alter their size to be really big or really small. For our last new ancestry, we're going to go back again to snake people, sort of. Uh, from a distance, the Vishkanya will appear human, but closer looks will reveal their uh, snake-like qualities, whether it's subtle scales, uh, ophidian eyes like snakes with like the slits, uh, and a forked tongue. They have naturally venomous blood, which can they can use to poison their weapons, and it becomes very potent as you level up if you continue to bump into it. Um, and they can also use it to heal. So a very nice, um, sort of unexpected strange for me, as not an expert on Galarian sort of ancestry. Um, and between this and the Nagaji, if you just really like the idea of, uh, you know, you want tea or snake folk, you've got a lot of great options. And uh, with the beastkin as well, you know, you could be a beastkin, snake folk, so. Uh, but it's very cool to have all these different options for what is a pretty classical fantasy trope of the snake people. I mentioned heritages get some love here, and we see uh, new flesh warp heritages and feats, including an ability to, I hate it, uh, <laughs> including an ability to grow a horse-like protrusion from your body, uh, almost like the monster uh, Nukalevi, I think is the pronunciation. Um, we'll maybe put a picture up here. Uh, it's horrible, and I hate it, so, you know, thank you. Bye, <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure for, I'm sure one day I'll have a character, or I'll have a player who has a character who is super excited about it but it's very gross. Uh, you know, you just grow this horse-like thing to act as a mount off of your lower body, and then it, I guess, falls away and decays. Genie can also get a few extra feats, including one for each of the four elemental genie kin that we have, uh, and the rest being sort of universal. Hopefully this uh, genie kin support means that we're going to see the wood and metal genie kin come in uh, Rage of Elements next year. Uh, that's the book that's going to have the kineticist. Uh, so it's nice to see them now as sort of a, I hope, again, uh, as sort of a confirmation that uh, we will get those extra genikin heritages, or lineages would be the term, uh, when that book comes out rather than being abandoned. So, And there's a lot of that in this book, actually, where uh, concepts and ideas that I would say that my friend group and I at least uh, talk about being worried that they're just going to be sort of abandoned once they're introduced, and it's really nice in this book. Uh, and we'll talk more about it as we go and, the, and it comes up, but there's a lot of examples of them revisiting these ideas that are very good ideas, uh, that needed more, just more options, because more options are always better. Uh, and so it's just been very nice reading through this book and seeing all the things that I really liked coming back and getting more love. Uh, finally, we get a new tiefling lineage based on Azuras, uh, as well as an expansion of the existing uh, beast brood lineage, uh, which was specifically a Rakshasa tieflings. Other player options include new animal companion, uh, that is an eight-armed iguana, uh, and a new magic blue elephant familiar. Uh, we get some new items and equipment, including an armored coat and a few new base weapons like the Chris, Talwar, and the Broadspear, there's several, uh, and a new combination weapon, as well as a gunslinger way focused on combination weapons, uh, named for the new combination weapon called uh, the Trigger Brand. Uh, we get several new spell catalysts, uh, grimoires and grimoires, and new magic items like a palanquin that is carried by spectral figures, magic cubes that can put up barriers and walls of protection, a new, a few new magical tattoos, and a few new alchemical items based around oozes. We did not get much in the way of uh, spells. Uh, we only got two new incarnate summon spells. Uh, but incarnate cool spells are very cool, and from Secrets of Magic, really glad to see those continuing to be represented and not just forgotten. We also get a new archetype, the Shield Marshal, which is representing Alkenstar City's uh, City Watch, who get uh, special prosthetic eyes and are very good at you know perception-based and sort of watching out for things. Uh, this archetype is woefully short on feats, unfortunately, only giving you feats at 2, 4, 8, and 10, and each time only one option. Um, as somebody who plays a lot of free archetype, that means that you're going to have to use special rules to 
uh, you know, to even qualify for your next archetype, or you're just going to have this blank spot at level six with nothing to do. So uh, I don't, uh, I'm pretty bummed about that. But overall, it's uh, like a lot of the archetypes that we see in Lost Omens. It's very niche, very uh, setting a region specific for its usefulness. Um, but, you know, there's always going to be somebody who sees it and thinks, well, this is very cool and I can't wait to do it. Uh, so, you know, not every archetype is made for me, right? Um, but I do, I do just wish that when they're introducing archetypes, they at least make sure that you can get the three in a row so that you can qualify for the next archetype. Small complaint. We do get additional feats for uh, uh, the Student of Perfection archetype from the Lost Omens World Guide and a reprint of the Jelmeri Heaven Seeker, which uh, archetype which honestly needed one because it uh, had a uh, needed a nerf badly for the Heaven's Thunder feat, which was giving you up to 20 extra damage. Um, so they lowered that to scale different scale not with your level, but with the uh, fundamental runes on the weapon. So it's quite a bit slower and quite a bit uh, lower. The Bopon section of the book gives us a nice expansion to the Flay in the Fae influence ancestry feats, uh, adding new animal traits that your uh, Fae influence is sort of reminiscent of, and eventually completing your transformation into a full fledged Fae creature, which is very cool. Um, my, uh, I was talking about that. Basically, you have now, if you wanted to take that, you have an option of your ancestry your heritage, your versatile heritage, and are you, uh, do you have this fey blood that might, you know, manifest and alter your body even further? So uh, you can really do some, and they, I think they have a uh, human vampire uh, genie kin picture in the book as well, and it just goes to show that while you can absolutely still play a vanilla human or an orc or, you know, whatever you're into, you can get really weird with Pathfinder 2nd Edition, and I, I just love to see it. Um, so having that sort of expanded upon so that it's there's going to be more characters who will find something to like in that Fae Influence group of feats, uh, you know, which just opens up all the options that you can have in your Ancestry feats options as you level up, uh, is just really great to see. And I hope we see some more things like the Fae Influence. I hope we get another one or two things that are neither quite ancestries or heritages, but that you can tack on to get another pool of feats to choose from, especially if they're uh, not going to ex give more expansions to some of the existing ones, like the ones that were added in the uh, Advanced Player's Guide and the uh, Ancestry Guide that just didn't... Uh, I have a player who's playing a Kitsune, for example, right now, and there's a couple of levels where really just sort of taking things that you don't necessarily love, but you got to take something. So... Uh, so having things, having another thing like the Fey influence would be really cool. Also, we get a few extra class feats. Uh, we uh, almost like discount archetypes again, like how the uh, Fey influence is a discount sort of uh, ancestry or heritage. Um, they add a chain of thematic feats around uh, different ideas introduced in the book. For example, uh, one around scouting Fey locations, like in Mopan, uh, for gunslingers, investigators, and rangers uh, that just give you some tools for you know, being in extra dangerous fey-infested woods. And uh, there's also one that's uh, a set of three feats for bards, rogues, and swashbucklers that is flavored around dancing out of harm's way and even into the air. Uh, we saw some stuff like this in Book of the Dead and Knights of Last Wall and even Dark Archive. So again, it's just nice to see this trend continue of further supporting things that um, could very well have been left alone on the side and no one would have questioned it. But uh, the developers wanted to continue to add to them, and that's just really, I mean, that's just great uh, service to your fans who like this stuff, and also just great design to have these things that, and it speaks to the modular design of 2E, where, you know, something doesn't have to be complete when you release it. You can add more as you go, as the developers have more fun ideas and things that you can mix in. Finally, we get uh, some more curses and monsters and hazards for uh, GMs to throw at their players. Not a lot of each, but we didn't have a lot of curses to begin with, and I really do think that we uh, added almost half again as many curses as we had, uh, which is very cool. And uh, we're about, uh, I think, 15-ish new monsters, so not a huge number. Uh, but there was something in the back that I really liked. It was like a section of monsters that make sense for each of the areas of the Impossible Lands you know, things that you were most likely to see there and, you know, which books you can find them in, of course. Um, so that was a really nice little touch, and there's a few things like that throughout the book. Um, overall, I think this is a great book. I think that I say this a lot, and I feel kind of silly just that I always bring it up, but I did not 
expect to like this series and uh, this line as much just being a homebrew uh, player or homebrew GM in my world, not Galarian. I didn't think I would get a lot of mileage out of this line, and they have consistently, regularly proved me wrong. Um, you know, just the new ancestries, of course, but also just the ideas. Like I said, flipping through this book, reading through, reading all the lore, it's just so much delicious stuff to steal from my homebrew world. So uh, thanks, as always, to the folks over at, uh, at over at the Lost Omens for making me look uh, like an even more creative gym. So thank you for that. Uh, and for this book, it's just tremendous. I can't recommend it enough. You go out and pick it up. If any of this sounds remotely interesting to you, the mechanics are there, the lore is there, the content is there. There is a lot in this book, and it's a big book. I don't have it with me. I'm waiting for the physical delivery. I was uh, using the PDF to write this, but uh, it's very good. And so uh, that's it. What do you think? Do you, have you gotten your hands on it yet? Um, what are you most excited about? Are you you know excited about any of the ancestries? The Venar for me, I just couldn't be more pumped for that. Um, but you know, uh, where do you think we're going to go next? We know that we're going to get High Helm and there's been a lot of talk about, uh, Tiansha and Tiansha, I'm sure I'm saying all these wrong, <laughs> but there's been a lot of talk about these other places that we might go to next. Um, so where do you want to go to next? Come down in the comments and let us know. Thank you so much for watching. We really appreciate it. Have a great day. See you next time. Bye.